Hi, this is Cassie Brider, and this is another episode of The Empowered Trans Woman. And I'm here with Rachel Williams, who is um, calling me from St. Louis. Hello. Hey, how's it going? Very good. Rachel has a website called Trans Philosopher that I want to hear all about. And uh, I'm also very curious to get perspectives from other different parts of the United States. So it'll be interesting to talk about the differences that I experience here in California versus what you experience out there in St. Louis. Yeah, that's exciting. So you're in California. I'm curious because uh, we're actually thinking of moving to California really soon. So, um, so I might be coming out west. Um, for uh, in the near future, but I've been in St. Louis for a few, a few years now, so um, yeah, I'd be happy to talk about that. I was in St. Louis for a very short time uh, for work, but this was before transitioning. I don't know if I would uh, dare to <laughs> to uh, live in, in Missouri or in uh, uh, neighboring states right now. I, I have a good friend in, uh, in Missouri, um, who who is a trans activist and generally speaking she has a pretty good ride but i think california is better yeah no i that's why we're moving out there we're moving out there for a reason missouri is not really like you know a long-term future for us but st louis hasn't been that bad there's really been um you know it's kind of like a, a pocket of like liberal sanity and otherwise like very um red state and so <laughs> i haven't experienced too much difficulty here like things have been pretty smooth sailing i think a lot of it's going to depend on the person as far as like what your inex what your experiences go um you know what sort of privilege you have etc cetera, etc cetera. so all, all that stuff's going to matter i think as far as like um but there is actually a pretty uh, you know decent trans community here in st louis um so it's uh, I've been a part of it ever since I started transition about three years ago now. So um, you know it's, it's a small community, but it's fairly fairly active, and um, there's good people here. And um, so your I'm transition nice. is actually pretty recent, then. My transition. Mm -hmm. I guess so. I don't know. Three years. Like I don't know. Like it feels like forever, but it also feels like it just happened. Like. <laughs> I don't know. I, I go back and forth about whether I consider myself post transition or not. Like, how long is that? Like, there um, are all these uh, all all these different nuances that uh, are, are kind of difficult to process. I think I, I'm kind of in the same boat. Um, and I don't know if uh, transition is something that has a finite end, almost. You know? Yeah, it's yeah, it's really interesting. Um, I mean, it's, in some respects, like medical stuff I haven't like you know completed my journey in all those respects but in other respects as far as like becoming comfortable with myself or you know coming into my own sense of identity like I definitely am more comfortable with that so I feel like transition is happening on like different layers or different levels at different speeds and different intensities um so um in some respects i feel like i have found my voice but in other mm -hmm. respects i feel like i'm just getting started so. <laughs> yeah i totally i totally understand what you mean um do you want to talk a little bit about your journey and uh, what have uh, the previous um uh, i'm gonna guess 19 years <laughs> I mean... oh, come on i'm 31 um, <laughs> I'm going to just go give you the, the, the short version. Sure. Um, but essentially, I have always kind of struggled with gender in one way or another. Um, but it was always very deeply repressed for the longest time. And when I was married in my 20s, um, you know, I really wanted to explore my gender more, but I was kind of like, didn't really have that encouragement from my ex-wife to do so. Um, and then we were involved in open marriage. So she was dating someone and she fell in love with him and left me for him. And basically as soon as she left me, I started exploring my gender because there was nothing stopping me. Mm -hmm. um, just kind of like the, the opportunity to um, explore things that I've been wanting to explore for so long. Um, 
it just I, I, everything fell into like the right time at the right place and it just everything happened very suddenly from there it's like um i transitioned i got on hormones um i was able to do it at my work more or less instantly because i was in grad school um at the time and it's you know grad school and academia is generally a fairly accepting place for trans people to transition so my department was like really good um so it just all happened really fast and that was about three years ago so um it's just been kind of crazy ever since then <laughs> you touched on something that i think is really important uh, and um, i'm kind of hoping that these um that these interviews help um, not only just in giving us visibility and um, in helping people understand their journey, but also in being potentially markers and uh, um, guides of sort for, for girls that are transitioning. Um, there's this point where you're like not beholden to anybody else, where you're not accountable for other people, which really allows you to you know spread your wings and fly, so to speak. And I had a moment like that, and I had this amazing epiphany, which is, I'm at a place where I don't owe anybody anything. I can actually do this, you know, and not everybody has that luxury, I think. Yeah, no, for, um, for me, I definitely had one of those light bulb epiphany moments. Um, and yeah, I think I think everyone's going to have a different story here. So I think for some people, it's going to be like, they, they might have had that light bulb moment 10 years ago, and they've just kind of been like waiting for the right, like, practical circumstance to happen or they might have had a slow realization over many years or maybe um like me like their realization that they were trans and that they wanted to transition like more or less corresponded to like when they were able to start transitioning so for me like my own self-discovery and my beginning of my journey started at the same time mm -hmm. um but i just kind of got lucky <laughs> Um, I don't know if it's luck though, because maybe I would have been happier if I had like you know, came to this realization, um, you know, 15 years ago. But then again, it's like I wouldn't be who I am today if I hadn't like gone through that those experiences. So, um, that, and it's something I actually write about a lot in a lot of my writings. It's a recurring theme: is this idea of, um, you know. If I had discovered myself earlier and transitioned earlier, I wouldn't have accumulated the the experiences I did, like living pre-transition, and I wouldn't be the same person. So do I like myself now enough to want to keep being that person, or do, would I really want to be someone else? So that's kind of a question I've been playing with for a long time. Um, it's a challenge, and I, I think that that's, that's a question that, that is very common for not only for trans girls but for anybody that's undergone any kind of major life change uh, people that have uh, migrated from one country to another uh, or people that have changed careers there's always the question of like what if i had done it earlier what if i had done it later and yeah. it's it's an undetermined answer for me like you say um there's uh there's a lot of good that came from the journey that i had but at the same time, uh, I, I would have really liked to have had a, um, a youth as a girl and uh, or even a childhood as a girl. And that, that feels a little uh, melancholy sometimes. Yeah, no, for sure. I think there's definitely like a sense of nostalgia that's very specific to trans people that I've encountered over and over and over. And um, me personally, my sense of nostalgia or like, I guess a lost sense of nostalgia or like feeling like an absence of a nostalgia that should be there for this like childhood, I don't really experience it as strongly, I think, as some other trans people because I had a pretty decent, I guess like well-adjusted childhood. It wasn't really, like, I didn't really have like identity problems like so much in childhood. There was like, kind of like um you know like cross-dressing behind closed doors that i kind of like struggled as far as like dealing with that but it wasn't this like intense dysphoric struggle through puberty that i think a lot of trans people go through and so i feel like different people are going to have different feelings about their childhood and whether they had a good childhood or a bad childhood it's going to factor into whether they feel like they missed out on something, I guess. Um, I yeah, know. and that's also important 
to uh, highlight, and I've, I've, I'm fortunate enough that it comes up pretty often as I interview different trans gals that the experiences are really varied, and um, this common mainstream narrative, I don't know if I can use the word mainstream in here, but you know, the mainline narrative that gets surfaced potentially in the media, the, the, um, the struggle with, um, with one's genitalia at three or four, it does exist with, with some kids, uh, it does exist with some people, but it's not, it, it, one is not less trans or more trans because of having one experience or another. Yeah, one of the examples that I use in, um, in, in an essay that's in my book is, um, you know, so for example, take a painter. Say a painter starts painting when they're 40 years old. They're not less of a painter when they're 40. It's just, so if you're, a painter is someone who paints, and you know, likewise a trans person is just someone whose gender is different from their assigned gender, and that can happen at any age. So... Kind of, I think we're kind of obsessed with the origins of things and kind of like using the origins of identity to secure the validity of that identity. But I feel like that's a very dangerous game to play um, because it just doesn't really have any um, moral significance. Like, why should we care? Like, just because it has a certain origin, um, it doesn't seem to. Um, be significant. I don't know. That's my that's my feeling. I know some people might disagree about that. But. I really liked what you just said. The 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 need to to justify or to or or to find the validity by looking for the origin, uh, or or looking for the longevity of something. You know, like quite often you hear of people talking in terms of a successful marriage because it's lasted a certain number of years. Um, yeah. And that's not necessarily any kind of um, indication of quality, perhaps. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, the way I think about it is in terms of authenticity. So that's generally the framework through which I think I view a lot of like mm -hmm. um, transgender issues is through this this perspective of authenticity. And I kind of understand authenticity as far in terms of like being true to this like deep vision of how we want our lives to go. So I think we all kind of deep down have this kind of like big picture idea of like how we want our life to go and it's not just like this surface level vision of like oh you know i need to go to the grocery store next week it's like kind of like this larger narrative of how we understand these are ourselves um and i think trans people have a very like keen understanding of how these big narratives like can impact our life because that's the impetus for us making a, a transition is trying to um, live in accordance with that deep vision. Um, and so that vision, the origin of it, of, of it don't, it doesn't really matter. Um, and, and it's more about, uh, you know, so if that deep vision only came to you when you were 30 years old, that doesn't make it like less valid and if that vision came to you when you were like five years old. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think there's this worry that like, if we don't ground things in biology and in like childhood and in origins and, and these innate factors, then it all kind of like descends into like subjective chaos. But that I, I think that's a false dichotomy. And I think that we we find easy ways to represent something for people that are not familiar with this experience. We find easy ways to um, to ground it in something that they'll identify with, and because of that, these narratives emerge. And uh, then it's sort of easy to pander to the narratives instead of going, well, you know, actually, this is this is just one story, and it could be uh, many different stories, and somebody could come to the actualization that they are trans at uh, 3 or 7 or 15 or 57. And yeah. uh, like I really love that analogy of the painter as somebody who paints um, because ultimately it's about what emanates from you. One of the ways that um, I explained recently my trans experience to somebody is if I was left on a desert island and I were to interact with no human 
for the rest of my life, I would be a woman on a desert island. I mean, this is not performative. This is not something that I'm trying to appease the world with or, or trying to prove anything to anybody with. There's a lot of accoutrements that kind of pile up over time where you have to pander to certain things in society. But at my core, by myself, with left to my own, by my own devices with nobody to interact with, I'd be a woman. So <laughs> uh, I yeah. think, that, yeah. That's a really interesting question as far as like... Um you know, thinking about to what extent gender would exist as a phenomenon in that kind of like Robinson Crusoe settings, though. Mm -hmm. So to what extent, you know, for some gender things are inevitably social, so as far as like communication. So, you know, the gender differences as far as like communication style, are you have a more softer tone or a more like aggressive tone? Well, if you're living by yourself, you're who, you, who are you going to be communicating with? So, like, the window of gender itself is going to be narrower because there's less, like, context in which for you to, like, express your gender. And so it's interesting, I think, like, those sorts of, like, things. But I think I know a lot of trans people have talked about it in terms of, like, focusing on, a, at the very least, how they want their bodies to be. And mm -hmm. on that desert island... You're still going to look in the reflection in the mirror and see your body and feel your body and be embodied in your body. And those desires aren't really going to change. Um, I think in terms of analogies a lot, and one, one thought that comes to mind is uh, my, my first language was actually Russian um, because I grew up in a Russian household, but my main language has been Spanish. And then I adopted English. And so quite often somebody would ask me, well, what's your core language? Because right now I interact with the world in English. I hardly ever touch on the other languages. But so here's my litmus test, which is when I'm counting, when I'm doing math in my head, I'm doing it in Spanish. <laughs> so there's these little tells where to yourself in your own little world, you know certain things about yourself, which are core to you. I don't know if, that, if that's a very apt analogy, but... Uh, yeah, no, I think that makes sense. It's about, you know, what kind of is automatic to us, like mm -hmm. what kind of comes natural. Um, and I think there is a sense in which gender is about what comes naturally. But I also think there's a sense in which there's a sense in which gender has to do with like things that aren't necessarily automatic, but maybe like it kind of comes into that performative element that I think a lot of feminists in the kind of the social constructivist tradition have talked about as far as like, um, you know, what are these like cultural choices we're making that go into the phenomenon of gender? And so I think whenever I talk about gender, I always want to emphasize that this is like a super complicated thing. And it's really hard to pin it down to one phenomenon. And so I think the Robinson Crusoe desert island expression of gender is like one aspect of it. But then there's this whole other cultural element. And for me, the interesting part is that like interaction between the desert island like aspects of gender and the more like cultural aspects and see mm -hmm. how those like come together because I think that's where because we're never going to be on that desert island <laughs> hopefully like, <laughs> you know, that's, uh, yeah that's for sure um, I'm wondering if you can speak to this which is um, um, the whole concept of passable and um, the the challenges that arise from that because in um, in talking about marginalization um one model that sometimes gets used is that there's um, there's marginalization which is impossible to hide and there's marginalization which becomes sort of a choice. For example, a black person can't choose to not present black. And so because of that, um, they have a constant level of marginalization that they don't have, they don't have agency over. But a Jewish person gets to make the choice of if they announce their faith or if they keep it hidden. And so uh, in the case of the black person, there's there's a whole bunch of baggage with that. And there's a whole bunch of discomfort with that. But at the same time, there's, there's um, an easy belonging that I never point to they forsake. Like 
with with the Jewish person, they might have to make a choice at some point, or they might feel forced into making a choice where they're like, do I surrender my identity for the sake of not being marginalized? So non-passable trans women don't have to make a choice. They know that they're the trans woman in the room. Yeah. But as you move into passability and all that, anyway, I think that you understand where I'm, where I'm going. That, that's interesting you brought up the, the concept of race because from listening to people of color, they also deal with this issue as far as like people who are white passing. Mm -hmm. you know, so if you're lighter skinned, but you know, a person of African American ancestry, then you, know, you deal with that same struggle of you in certain contexts, you are sort of you know, passing for white. And so there is that same issue. And it is a spectrum, I think, you know, as and just like there's a spectrum of skin tones that allows people of color to sort of like have the spectrum of passing and, and privilege you know interact with that spectrum the same then there's a there's a passing spectrum so you can be like you know I think 70 percent passing or like 80 percent passing or, or and and the issues that a trans woman who passes like 30 percent are much much different than the issues of a trans woman who passes like 95%, and those issues are very, very different from the issues of someone who passes 100% who's stealth, because as we all know, the, the experience of a, I, I don't know what it's like to be stealth, because I'm not stealth, but from what I understand, and just like thinking about what it would be like to be stealth, it's obvious to me that someone who is 100% passable is going to have a really different experience with, you know, coming out to people, and, you know, being visible versus non-visible um and me personally i struggle with it every day because right now is a sort of pay the bills i deliver pizza and we have to wear these uniforms that's very androgynous and people kind of already have these like cultural expectations about like who delivers pizza and so i'm constantly getting misgendered and just like and so i yeah like i i experience it every day and it's just frustrating and it does kind of like impact my own identity in a way because i like internalized this like this like visibility where like because of the fact that my own passing is ambiguous like my own identity has become ambiguous as a result <laughs> of that exposure so like um, and i feel like that's just a defense mechanism really we had a glitch <laughs> yeah <laughs> okay i think we're back um, and while we were trying to reboot, uh, Rachel and I were talking about um, uh, the fact that some of these terms that kind of emerge from marginalization, port over from one marginalized group to another, the term passable um, was a common that was term that the uh, term that was common in uh, people of color judging each other as to the levels of um, um, possibility that they had as white people and uh, we're using it in our community to define how we pass as cis people. Yeah, and, and I think you are right to point out that it is about the process of marginalization, So, because this issue of the visible versus the, the invisible happens in all kinds of um, ways. In the way that it was like disability, so people who have like an invisible disability, people kind of like, have this image of people who are disabled as like, oh, you have a wheelchair or you're in crutches, but someone might have some kind of disability that might not be a bit, like visible. And I've heard stories of, you know, they have a handicap thing in their car and it's like, yet they're, you know, walking to you know, like the store and people will, like give them a bunch of crap over the fact that like, you know, they don't have a limp or something. So it's like, this issue of like visibility, I think, happens on a lot of different layers, mm -hmm. um, and usually for a lot of people, especially in I think the queer and trans community, a lot of these things are like very mixed together. So if you're, you know, queer, trans, and a person of color, then you have all this stuff interacting at multiple layers of visibility and, and invisibility. Um, so it's usually these things are never like simple. Mm -hmm. um, That's why the whole idea of uh, intersectionality is so important. 
because um, it's not just about one linear um, narrative, but it's about how, because systems of oppression don't just specialize in oppressing <laughs> one type of people. They usually kind of spread the wealth. <laughs> But you know, I wanted to I wanted to say something which hopefully might help you. Um, um, first of all, I don't, I'm not trying to be patronizing anyway, but just objectively looking at you, I see a woman and I don't see any um, ambiguity about it. But um, one, and I'll start with with kind of a funny story, which is um, about a year ago, the kids and I ordered uh, pizza, and a very ambiguous. Uh, ambiguously gendered person came to my door and because of the fact that I'm very um, steeped in trans culture right now and uh, it's something that not only is my journey but I also it's my activism etc I immediately perked up thinking oh um. <laughs> so this person is um, not very curvy um, I'm thinking uh, assigned female at birth uh, I'm thinking potentially trans, um, potentially non-binary, um, shaped head, so kind of mixed signal, so, so to speak. And uh, so I come to the door and I'm thinking I'd like to broach a conversation, but at the same time, I don't want to be rude. But then their tag says Eli. So at this point, I'm thinking it's a trans man. Uh, but again, I don't want to make any assumptions. So I say, um, if you don't mind my asking, what are your preferred pronouns? Which actually, no, I said pronouns. I don't like to use the word preferred. Uh, what are your pronouns? And she looks at me bewildered and she says, I'm a girl. <laughs> Which I immediately tried to compensate. And I said, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I'm trans. So I process a lot of things through a filter. And I just wanted to make sure that I give you the right pronouns. But I said, but, but you know, I have to ask you, your tag says Eli. And she laughs and she says, it says Ellie. My name is Elizabeth. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. Yeah. Um, I think that it is interesting how I think it's very natural for us to want to kind of figure it out. You know, if someone is ambiguous, it, it's like, I think there's a certain tendency in the human mind to like not want to leave things kind of like uncertain. We want to kind of like know like, okay, well, are you coming from like the trans feminine spectrum or the trans masculine spectrum? We want to like kind of like isolate people. I know. Like, and and I, I felt isolate. stupid about it because I really had, if you think about it, I had really no particular need to know. Uh, I could have just given them the money for the pizza and being done with that, but I was trying to be personal and I was trying to engage this person in conversation. Um, well, it also, you know, reminds me that, you know, like we are kind of, kind of, I think so, um, you know, desperate to, to see people who are like us. And it's like, you know, when we see people, it's always kind of awkward, like, oh, like, I clocked that person, but, like, do I let them know that I clocked them? Because what if, like, I'm wrong? Because, like... Yeah, do you, you know, say something? Do you not, besides, the other person might not want to hear that they didn't pass, or that you would, that, that you noticed, or something like that. So it, it's kind of a yeah. tenuous area. But uh, I guess one of the reasons why I'm saying this is because, in this case, this was a cis woman. Yeah. Who I misgendered in, inadvertently. Sometimes I think that because we we suffer a little bit of a death by a thousand arrows in misgendering, um, we carry this fatigue, do you know what I mean? But um, a cis friend pointed out to me that she gets misgendered occasionally and that... Yeah, I, I know plenty of cis women who get misgendered on a regular basis. Like there's cis women I know who have kind of like a deeper voice or cis, I know a cis woman who's like 6'4". And even though she's beautiful, she's constantly getting misgendered because of how tall she is. Um, or just, you know, kind of people who are on uh, kind of like um, just a little like androgynous. And, but I've also kind of heard that this phenomenon is like accelerating. Like I think in the post-Trump world, mm -hmm. and now that we're kind of like more people are aware of trans people, I think the cis women who were more androgynous are getting 
misgendered more, but it's not out of like the same confusion. It's because people are assholes. So if they like slightly suspect you're trans, then they're gonna like misgender you on purpose because they wanna like be mean to you as because they're just like assholes. And there's people out there who are, are like that. Um, That's what triggers for me is the is the the doubt of is this um, just the natural ambiguity of things? Is this um, ignorance and curiosity, or is it malice? And 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 I get a little looped into that. You know what I mean? But yeah, however, yeah. I get misgendered on the phone a lot um, because I think voice is one of my challenges. And um, I had I don't know I had like a turning of the corner, which I wanted to share with you in in case it, it's it's of any help to you at the door. You know, like when you're delivering pizza, is um, I noticed that we as trans women carry this um, sensitivity to the topic and, and we, we carry wounds on the topic. So what would have been a propensity on my part if somebody um, says sir or somebody says he or somebody says mister or something like that, there would have been a propensity for me maybe a year ago to get really riled up and to be like, well, actually, let <laughs> and to have this whole diatribe about trans rights and stuff like that and uh now if i get uh sir on the phone i just go oh actually ma'am and we just keep on going and it's this extremely light subtle moment and i mean if they don't change their tune and if it happens again i'm like honey i've corrected you before i'm a woman please address me as ma'am uh and i get a little testy but um, what I find is that I address it the way that a cis woman would address it. I don't, I don't get into this whole, I don't get caught up in this whole like trans rights activist thing. My thing personally is that I almost never correct anybody if I get mm -hmm. misgendered. I kind of just have a very like, just kind of like, I, I just don't react. I just like, kind of like. My whole strategy is to let people gender me in the way that comes natural to them. And my mm -hmm. goal is, like, if it doesn't come naturally to them, then it doesn't really quite mean the same to me. Because, like, the types of gendering that I care about is not so much, like, what some random stranger thinks, but, like, my coworkers, my close friends, my family, these sorts of things. People who know me, who really get to know me. And the people who really know me, when... When the she, her pronouns come natural to them, that's what it means more to me. So when I'm at work interacting with, like, customers, you know, wearing my androgynous, like, pizza uniform or whatever, um, it doesn't really bother me as much when I get misgendered, partly because I'm so used to it, but also partly because, like, I know they're just reacting to these kind of, like, surface-level cues, and they're not really, like, reacting to who I am, but... You know, but my coworkers, like they, like like the women, the women I work with, they like have included me in that circle of women, and those sorts of relationships are so much more affirming than the random stranger who like quickly assesses my visual characteristics. You know I really, saying? really like that. You said a couple of things which I think are really profound. Um, if it doesn't come naturally, it doesn't have the same value. And I, I think that's important because I think sometimes we get caught up in policing people's language. I know I have. And um, it, it really doesn't matter what they say. What matters is what they think and feel much more than what they say. Um, I really liked what you added, which is it's the people that matter. It's not the random stranger that ultimately will, uh, will mean something or not. So yeah. I think that's pretty, uh, pretty important. But you mentioned um, essays in a book. So I was curious to pull your tongue a little bit more about this book of yours. Yeah, no, for sure. Okay, so well, the book, um, the story for the book goes back to when I first started, started transition almost three years ago. Um, I, uh, you know, started my blog, Trans Philosopher. And the reason I started the blog is because I've been blogging just in general for over a decade now, just about anything in general. Um, for the longest time, I always blogged about philosophy and psychology. 
Um, I had this old blog called Minds and Brains, and it was about like philosophy and psychology and cognitive science, basically anything I was interested in. And I blogged on there for a long time. And so when I started transitioning, I started thinking and spending all this time thinking and reading about gender. So I was like, well, I'm a blogger, I'm a writer. I like to, I process my thinking through writing. And so I wanted to put out my thoughts on trans stuff because I knew like, hey, like I'm probably gonna start thinking about this trans stuff more. And so I started just like, you know, getting my thoughts out there and trans philosopher and, um, and you know, so I started writing on my blog, and over time, I, uh, you know, I've been writing on these issues for like three years now, and I just kind of took the best essays and I put them um, in a book, and now the book is coming out with Jessica Kingsley Publishers, and um, I just signed the contract today, actually. So, um, you know, I'm gonna uh, get the manuscript together in the next month or so and submit it and I'm really excited but I think it's going to be really really cool because I've been working on these essays for a long time and they represent I think um, you know like I think some really like interesting concepts in trans feminist thought that I don't think are really explored as much in these discussions so I'm like looking forward to introducing some new ideas some new topics and new conversations into this community um, and really kind of starting a conversation about you know identity and philosophy and um, you know what does it mean to be trans because um, yeah I don't know so that's kind of the book in a nutshell so and I'm glad that you brought up the topic of trans feminism I'm actually um, very soon to give a talk about the intersectional feminism from a trans woman's point of view Something that I found um, a little troubling, quite frankly, is the fact that uh, in conversations I had with, uh, uh, with trans women, especially with late transitioning women, um, I'm finding that we don't know about feminism, we don't know the basic um, history of feminism, we don't know enough and I think that it behooves us to know and I think that it's really important for us to not just be um, standing up for trans rights or, or, or even more specifically for the for the rights of trans women but uh, for us to endorse and push forward the rights of women in general which um, as a group um, hasn't the group has endured marginalization for um, something that I kind of laughed about with my best friend who's a cis woman is uh, she said that a potential gripe that could emerge from this wo cis woman side is that women were over here and men were over here and a whole bunch of warriors pushed it up and up and up and up and up and up and it's still not quite level but it's like over here and now we're like daintily stepping up and saying okay good <laughs> But, I mean, we're standing on the shoulders of giants. We need to pay homage to that to some degree. Yeah. Um, no, absolutely. I feel like in my own journey, feminism has been incredibly important. And I've also read from so many other trans women, particularly trans women who are kind of more into fem feminism and activism and... Um, kind of like trans activism is that a lot of us have had a, what's been described as a feminist awakening. So prior to transition, we weren't um, really uh, super, I guess, like um, aware of feminism or maybe like if we were, we were kind of like maybe half-assed feminists or, you know, me personally, before I transitioned, I was one of those feminists who was like, yeah, you know, the equality of the sexes, but, you know, why do we have to call it feminism? Why can't we just call it, like, humanism? And to this day, I'm deeply embarrassed by that. Um, but, yeah, I feel like, you know, it wasn't until I actually started, like, living as a woman and, like, living in society and being coded as a woman by everyone else and, like, also understanding as a trans person and as a trans woman what it's like to be marginalized and discriminated against 
and starting reading feminist literature that I had my own feminist awakening. And this has been incredibly important for my own journey um, and finding community and solidarity with other women and also like other femmes. Um, and uh, yeah, li- and listening to the voices of you know other marginalized people has been just you know totally eye-opening for me. Um, so I definitely feel like I grown as a feminist um my kind of like circle of empathy has really expanded so much more and now that i have like lost my privilege it's amazing like what happens when like i literally was like part of the like most privileged class of people on the planet and then like i stepped down a little bit and that shift just opened my eyes um and i think as far as the late transitioning trans women being a little slow to catch up. Um, there are also a lot of cis women who like are totally ignorant about like <laughs> feminism and like they, they haven't, they, they don't know the theory and the academics and they don't know what intersectional feminism is. Um, but, but I think we're all starting to wake up to this, especially mm-hmm. with the Me Too movement and the Women's March movements and the rise of trans activism and the rise of intersectional feminism. Mm-hmm. I'm really excited by this new wave of feminism that's happening right now. I think we're kind of like, you know, really stepping into like uh, very like exciting times to be feminist right now. So Absolutely. And I, I do understand why you would, might feel rueful about your previous stance about why can't we call it humanism and stuff like that because there is a very specific uh, experience that that we live as women but uh, I'm also called to mind to a friend of mine who spoke at the 2017 uh, trans woman summit uh, who is a PhD in what used to be called women's studies but uh, nowadays it's called social justice because of the fact that what used to um, study just in a really binary system, two genders out of which there is a power dynamic, power imbalance, and this one gender is the marginalized one. We now have all this gamut of genders. We now have all these different perspectives of different levels of uh, of marginalization. So intersectionality shakes things up. So it's not necessarily um, just about gender anymore even it's now you know about gender and race and income strata and levels of education and levels of access to to different things and all these different things combined but i think that um i i think it's good to call it feminism because it's still primarily i mean there's still some very really obvious um imbalances i think the whole feminism versus humanism like discussion it mirrors this black lives matter versus all lives matter (laughs) discussion i think it's the 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 same sort of people who are reluctant to get on board with feminism because like oh feminism is biased towards like women well it's like that's because women are the ones that are like being down downtrodden right now so it's like just like you know, yeah, of course, all lives matter, but right now we're focusing on the black lives because those are the lives that have this, like, history of being, like, oppressed in the system. And then the same thing with trans people and women in general. Exactly. Um, there's the example, of course, that if there's a house on fire, it's not really logical to say, well, all houses matter. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. It's the one that's on fire that matters. Um, but kind of going back to trans feminism and the why I'm so excited for my book is because I think there's very little trans feminism done by trans people themselves. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a lot of theory and discussion out there from, you know, academics and journalists and cis people who are kind of like using trans, the trans phenomenon as kind of like this intellectual exercise like i feel like so often our lives are discussed and dissected in like the cis media as something that's kind of like 
interesting or exotic or it has all these implications for feminism you know are we women are we not women and it's like this grand theoretical debate and it's always detached and theoretical and hypothetical but so little feminism is done by trans people themselves like i've extensively looked through all the literature on what books out there have been written by trans people that are you know in the feminist genre and you know the the one that always comes to mind is julia serrano's whipping girl um but it's like that was that was in 2007 it's been (laughs) over 10 years and she's 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 come out with a lot of great essays since then but i i i kind of want to see this book as like stepping into that conversation and um you know so i'm really excited to continue in that tradition of trans people like looking at our lives as inspiration for thinking about gender and how it intersects with you know all different kinds of things and um you know our political reality right now um Mm -hmm. and in the post-trump post-truth era (laughs) like there's some things that are like more important than ever, I think. So absolutely, yes. Um, do send me links because I'm going to add them to you know the description on YouTube and the description under the the video, um, so that people can find your book. Okay, so we don't. This is very like I just signed the contract today, so everything the the title is tentative right now, but it's probably. Something like trans feminism. I don't. We don't have the title yet, um, so I don't have like a link to the pre-order. So everything's a little like just getting started. Um, but I will keep you updated. Um, you can always send people to my website where I will continue to um, get updates with the book as it gets more developed, and that's transphilosopher.com. Um, transphilosopher.com. But, so um, and uh, do you also have a Facebook page for it? I do. It's uh, if you just look for trans philosopher on Facebook, there's a Facebook page, and most of the same articles I post on both um, things. Um, but uh, okay, but, there's know, so, it, there's something that I'd like to pivot uh, pivot on uh, because uh, this is something that I, I've had many conversations with uh, with the trans girls recently about. And it's the fact that you are in a in a relationship, and you've been in a relationship for 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 I'm sorry for how long? Um, we've been together for almost three months now. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, yeah, it's kind of been crazy. We kind of did the whole um, lesbian U-Haul thing. Uh, <laughs> Uh, we we met, we fell in love. Like I moved in like three days later. Like it's kind of just been this whirlwind um, thing. Um, it just kind of like everything happened at the right time. Um, but uh, but yeah, it's been, it's been. Would it be all right to ask you a few questions about relationships, dating, and stuff like that? Yeah, no, absolutely. I'm happy to talk about it. And actually, in in the book, I I do write about. Um, our relationship a little bit, and I write about, um, you know, polyamory in relationships and being a lesbian, and also like being a lesbian in the and um, or or being a trans woman in the lesbian community, and like uh, like trying to date in that kind of like queer lesbian space, um, and kind of like navigating those dynamics, and also the dynamics specific to like. Um, trans people dating other trans people because I've had a lot of relationships with with other trans women I've also had relationships with cis women and for me it's really interesting like the differences dating cis women and trans women and like how that works with like you know sympathizing with our dysphoria and feeling comfortable with ourselves and there's so much there um Absolutely. I wrote an article on uh, medium.com uh, called uh, What Do We Do About Women with a Penis? And uh, it touches on the cotton ceiling. It touches on um, the hesitance from uh, lesbians to date trans women. Uh, it cites Riley J. Dennis and her famous YouTube video. And uh, so I was interested to see what kind of experiences you've had in the lesbian world, your, your adventures in lesbian dumb. So, I've had a number of relationships with cis lesbians. Um, 
I was actually engaged to a cis lesbian for a little bit. Um, that relationship did not last, though. Um, I've been in, uh, like, the relationship I was in prior to this is a polyamorous triad relationship with a cis lesbian and another trans woman. So that was, like, really interesting. So I've kind of, I've dated non-binary people. Um, I've kind of been all over the place as far as, like, um, dating goes. But in my experience, like, yeah, there are going to be lesbians out there who don't want to date you because of, like, your anatomy or their expectations about trans women or their assumptions about us or maybe they're just their own personal histories or, you know, they might have a certain, you know, traumatic history in regards to certain body parts and, and others. So that there's, there's so much individual difference. And my whole thing is, like, I only want to be with people who are into me. And so if you're not into me, you're just not even on my radar. I do not care about you. And I acknowledge that being trans is, like, limiting my dating pool. But I also feel like I have to have enough cons- confidence and my worth as a dating partner to know that there are enough people out there who do want to date me and don't have a problem with me being trans and might even positively like the fact that I'm trans and and they're not with me like despite the fact that I'm trans maybe they're with me because they think it's cool or maybe they're like attracted to like you know people with more androgynous features like you know one of the recurring themes of the 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 lesbians who I'm in who have like dated me is usually they're more attracted to like androgyny like um, I dated this this lesbian and she was into like girls with deeper voices <laughs> like this women or trans women with deeper voices so it's like I don't know that's a thing and it's like um, so that's, that's a, there's something interesting there and it's a, it's this notion that um, people have different types of attraction and uh, something that keeps going through my head when we talk about this is that perhaps we're completely oversimplifying the word lesbian um and what does it mean just just like if we if we keep thinking in terms of spectrums if we keep thinking in terms of uh degrees instead of these binary kind of terms why wouldn't we apply this model to lesbian as a word as well in other words um we the oversimplification of course is that a lesbian is a woman that's attracted to women but then like you said within that there's all these different levels of attraction there's 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 gals that are attracted to really really femme types there's gals that are attracted to butch types there are girl, girls that um, have different levels of uh, homo flexibility and hetero flexibility and then there are women who are triggered by certain anatomical parts because of bad experience in the past and that has to be taken that has to be taken into account so it's and going back yeah. to what you said about the fact that you're only attract you're only looking for the people who are into you it's not really about molding a particular person to like us but just continue to look until we find somebody who likes us right yeah and i also think like as trans as a trans community i think we're going to have to deal eventually deal with the fact that some people do seem to have a particular attraction to us like as trans people so what what brings to to my mind is um there's recently this like pop star i can't remember her name like kalia or something she came out on twitter recently as like bisexual or pansexual or something but she talked about in her in her twitter um post about how she was like attracted to like um trans people like trans men like non-binary people and a lot of people gave her shit for it and called her out as being like fetishizing or objectifying trans people but i think we can like have the specific attractions like hey like i'm attracted to like know um afab non-binary people or i'm attracted to amab trans feminine people um without that attraction necessarily being fetishistic because for me it's like you can have a thing for brunettes without like 
completely reducing someone's total personality to the fact that they have brown hair. Like, exactly. Um, I've seen that play out really, uh, really well. Um, I belong to um, a couple of sex positive communities and uh, we've dissected these kind of a topics a couple of times. And um, it boils down to are you with somebody as a person or are you with somebody just because they fit a certain type? Uh, I am attracted to tall black men, so I will gravitate toward the tall black man in the room. But if he happens to be a Republican, <laughs> if he happens to not have anything in common with me, then the attraction will die off. And likewise, if he happens to like the same books, the same movies as I do, then the, the attraction will grow. Um, there are certain, you know, I, I generally like darker hair than light, lighter hair because of the fact that I grew up in South America. So there are certain um, elements of like um, socialization, I guess, that carry over. But if that's all, like, for example, I've been in a really uncomfortable um, situation where we went, and this is like eight years ago, uh, we went uh, with co-workers to a restaurant and there were two Asian gals and one very clueless white man who went on and on about how interested he is in dating Asian women. But the way he was describing it is like it's an amusement ride. <laughs> like it's uh, this particular adventure dating a, an Asian woman. And it was extremely objectifying and fetishizing in the way that he was talking about it. Um, so, I, I don't know, one example of that, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, I was just going to say, like, yeah, I think, like, th this issue comes up so many times, and so often I feel like, as trans people, we feel this need to, like, definitively define precisely the difference between, like, a fetish and a preference, and we kind of, like, want to find the boundaries for these cases, but I think when it comes to, like, oh, are they a chaser, or are they, like, a fetishizer, or whatever... I'm going to take it on a case-by-case -case basis, and it's just going to be one of those things, like, I know it when I see it. I can't define a chaser precisely, but I know a chaser when I see one. And, like, I think it's really hard to define, like, what exactly it means to be a chaser, and I think it's just more like a gut feeling I have about someone. Are they creepy? Or, like, but I think it's kind of like, you know, I've been with, like, cis women who I suspected had a thing for, like, um, the body types of, like, a pre-op, you know, trans woman. And it's, mm -hmm. like, you know, so, so often we think of, like, chasers as only, only being straight men, but I think women can be chasers and also trans people can be chasers. True story. So, like chasing itself is a spectrum and like trying to like figure out exactly what's problematic versus not problematic it's so the moment that you start fe feeling um disregarded as a human disregarded as a person and seen as a commodity or or as a resource i had a really really strange experience of many years ago when i was um really infatuated with a gal that really liked the fact that I spoke Russian because she wanted to learn Russian. And, uh, oh, hey, <laughs> uh, it's quite all right. So anyway, she wanted to learn Russian. And because of that, we were hanging out a lot. And, but we only spoke Russian um, because she wanted to learn, which I felt like that was perfectly uh, something that I could um, that I could pander to. But over time, I, it became really noticeable to me that she would only hang out with me if we spoke Russian, and that was the only thing that mattered. And so I started questioning, well, to what extent do I matter as a human? To what extent do I matter as a person? The answer ended up being, not a lot. <laughs> yeah, no. Um, and I've heard, you know, people who are, like, you know, women who are disabled, are fetishized, um, you know, women of color are fetishized, um, you know, so this is not just a trans issue, but I think for trans women, it, it's not something that's kind of talked about a lot, because even though, 
trans porn is like I think the fourth most popular category of porn on the internet it's so taboo no one talks about it it's not like acceptable for straight men to admit that they have an attraction to trans women um, you know this sort of thing is still scandalous it's you know a, a, a male celebrity who gets caught dating a trans woman that's still like a subject for the tabloids to gossip about so we haven't we, we are so far in our society from like normalizing like relationships with trans people yeah um, I think it was um, Laverne we, Cox who said that um, the the sea change is when uh, when a famous figure, a, a famous celebrity, uh, walks the red carpet um, arm in arm with a trans woman, when when that kind of um, unashamed, unshameable moment happens, where it's like, yeah, we're together, so what? Um, but we haven't yeah. seen that yet. And honestly, if you ask my my honest opinion about how far we how far we are away from that moment. I think we're a long ways because like this sort of attitude it, it's one thing to like I, I, I think it's going to be like the, the person walking down the, the, the red carpet with the trans woman on the arm that's going to happen what's going to take longer is for people to not challenge that man's sense of masculinity so it's kind of just going to be like they'll accept it and they'll tolerate it but they won't truly validate it as being like just as normal of a straight relationship as a relationship with a cis woman and that process is going to take a much longer time in our society because it's going to have to we're going to have to dig down to these deep transphobic beliefs that are operating in our society and those aren't going away anytime soon just like you know the civil rights movement happened like i don't know 50 years ago but racism is still alive and well as it ever was because it's like it's this larger institutional like process and transphobia it operates in the same way that's true yeah but it does vary from parts and parts of the country so um, earlier on, you had talked about moving to California. I think that's a really good idea. California is generally, in general, what I call the kingdom of Cascadia, California, Oregon, Washington, is is um, a really yeah, nice. We're, we're planning on coming to LA. That's where we want to um, move is to LA. So we're really excited. Like our lease is up in um, August, and so we're mm -hmm. probably gonna like start making our way out west in August or sometime. Oh, that's wow. wonderful, yes. And uh, um, there's also a pretty thriving polyamory culture here, so um, it is it is different, it, it is better. It's still, you know, you do encounter um, different levels of awareness, different levels of oppression, as you would everywhere else, but um, across the boards, I would say that it's better um, in, in all of the coastal states in the West. Washington is actually extremely um, trans-friendly, and so is Oregon, so those are also good options. But the weather is better here. <laughs> yeah, no, I can't wait. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I definitely think we're making progress. Like, it's just one of those things where it's like, is it going to be 10 years or 100 years? And it's like, I kind of suspect it's going to be 100 years. Um, but you know what? I saw this sentence that said, um, "Life is not about waiting for the storm to pass. Life is about dancing in the rain." And I've kind of adopted that as a personal motto, which is, um, "This is the time that we're given." And this was especially hard since November 2016 to process. But this is the time that we're living. And generations before me went through World War Two or went through World War One, so we can weather this and. Um, and we can thrive, you know, it's yeah. up to us to make it happen. Yeah. Deep down, I'm an optimist because even in, you know, post November 2016, I still think that this is nevertheless the best time to be trans in all of human history because there are more people who accept our humanity than ever before. Mm -hmm. um, and 
even though it might be one of those one step backwards, two step forwards, I think just having the knowledge that we are always going to be trying to step forward and like that that's enough to keep me going. So I do have a deep optimism. Um, it's just, yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> sometimes the optimism, like, um, it, it, it's very easy to lose sense of that optimism, that I think. Oh, I have those moments too, honey. Um, as we wrap up, I'm wondering if I could ask you if you have any advice um, for the gal that's just beginning to question or just beginning to transition. Um, I would say that if you're just beginning the process of transition, um, so there are some like immediately practical things like look into laser. <laughs> <laughs> facial hair loss but that's kind of like more practical stuff more on the bigger bigger picture thing i think the the biggest challenge i think um we face is dealing with our internal acceptance of ourselves because so much of like transition in the media and in like the online forums is all focused on like you know surgeries and hormones and medical stuff and all this kind of like external change and all that's really important insofar as it ties to our dysphoria but I think so often I hear people talk about the most important aspect of transition is that internal process of peace that that, that sense of like coming to terms with with yourself and finding peace so it's like yeah the hormones are gonna like change your body but they're also gonna change your mind and like you know finding like some clarity as far as mental health like you know maybe your depression will clear up or maybe your anxiety will be resolved a little bit or maybe your life will be slightly better and just realizing that um it's both the internal and the external process um and and just yeah enjoy it like it's, <laughs> a, it's a, a momentous time in your life and you'll never um you know, quite experiences again, so, like, I don't know. Um, I really um, like that. The concept of enjoying it is probably something that's foreign to a lot of girls who are really overwhelmed by the whole process, but th it is something to enjoy. It's something to look back on. It, it's going to be a unique, life-changing moment of your life, so my, might as well just enjoy it. I mean, I, I think I want to acknowledge that saying that there's a certain privilege in that because... I'm not someone who's like destroyed by my own dysphoria. Um, I struggle with dysphoria like a lot of trans people, but it, it doesn't cripple me. And I think some trans people are crippled by their dysphoria. And I don't really have anything to say to those people, except I just want to give them a hug and I want to like, you know, tell them that it'll be okay and that they're beautiful and valid. But at the end of the day, like, people struggle with their own dysphoria is incredibly personal. Like, there are trans women I know who are, like, I think are beautiful and gorgeous. And they have more intense dysphoria than, like, a trans woman who maybe doesn't pass so well. So it's, like, dysphoria is so personal and, um, you know, it, it's so hard to, like, get inside someone else's head and you never know what's going on in someone else's head so just um you know re realizing we're all on our own journeys and um just like developing like patience for both yourself and others you know will go a long way that's very good i i i think that that's a great note to to leave it at which is developing patience with ourselves and with others uh, yeah. We get in so, into so many uh, petty arguments and discussions and debates and uh, and cat fights among uh, uh, each other over um, who's doing trans right <laughs> and uh, just patience with ourselves and with each other. Yeah, okay, well, this, this has been so great. Thank you so much. Um, Thanks, Rachel. And let's uh, circle back when your book is out. I'm going to um, put this up on YouTube, but also come... Um, Either August or October, I'm going to get ready to do another summit, and uh, potentially we can touch bases again there, which uh, you're going to have more insights for me, I'm sure. 
Yeah, yeah that'd be awesome. I'd love to talk with you again. And um, thank you so much, and good luck with everything you're doing with Empowering Trans Women. So um, this is really great. So thank you again. Thanks, Rachel. And I'm going to press stop. And let's say goodbye. <laughs> okay, yeah.